Today's tropical update, in short, is going to be an interesting one. So I definitely want you to hang with me to the end. I'm going to get you all the information that you need to get you ready for what looks like a somewhat sporty August. And we'll talk all about that. Thank you so much for joining me here in the Mobile Weather Center. I have a flight to catch later on this evening. It's going to be a long night for me. But as promised, I was not going to delay getting you all the latest information on a number of the different things I'm tracking across the Atlantic Basin. Because again, as we rock through the gates of August 1st, I do think, especially towards that fateful Charlie anniversary, August 13th, we're going to have some big things out there that we want to pay attention to. And now notice, I'm not saying systems, named storms, or hurricanes, but there's some really good evidence in all of our model data that we will have a good amount of signals to track. And you can count on me to provide you with all that information, the up-to-date track as these features traverse the tropical Atlantic. If you are brand new to the channel, it would mean a lot to the rest of us here in the Weather Center community, especially myself. If you consider kindly clicking that subscribe button, giving that like button a little nudge, let's get this information out there to the masses who we believe will benefit from it. Share this content if you could be so kind as well, and drop me a comment in the comment section down below. It's been fantastic connecting with all of you, and once again, I do apologize if you can hear a little bit of frogginess in my voice. Your positive vibes, your positive comments are helping me kick this bug out of my system faster than we can say. Tropical season has started, but I still have a little bit of the residual effects I'm trying to hack up to tell you the truth. It's kind of like some of the Saharan air layer is stuck in my respiratory system, and like the tropics, we're going to clear it out very soon. And all right, with that being said, let's go ahead and rock in. So here is our latest GOES East full satellite disk. Number of things going on. First and foremost, the Eastern Pacific is ablaze once again as our convectively coupled Kelvin wave a la the MJO pulses a across the equatorial regions of the Pacific. We have a number of different areas of interest, and I do believe we have some strengthening name storms out there as well. Not going to pull that up just for the sake of time because I really want to get into the meat and potatoes of the Atlantic. So with that being said, again, we have a very interesting tropical wave that had a sudden burst of convection overnight last night during something called diurnal maximum. It does have a little bit of anticyclonic outflow. You can see the fanning out in that clockwise direction, the fanning out of that upper level cloud cover, the cirrus overcast that protrudes from the thunderstorms that did form near the wave axis itself. Not expected to become a contender, not expecting any further development. It's kind of wandering into a fairly unfavorable sector. What will eventually transform into a favorable quadrant of our Atlantic, we'll talk about that in a second, but very interesting flare up overnight, and it does look like it tried for a very brief moment to try to develop into something more than just an elongated area of tropical wave action. Now, I've been hearing a lot of talk about sinking, sinking, sinking. And while we are still seeing some of that sinking motion across the greater tropical Atlantic, the deep tropics, near the MDR, the intertropical convergence zone, I personally, just based off of what I see on satellite and some of the model parameters I'm going to walk you through, don't quite believe it's just sinking alone that's stopping the Atlantic from tapping into its potential. We've got some good substantial warming that's occurred across the MDR, the greater tropical Atlantic, and our subtropics have notably cooled. We no longer have that enormous bubble of extreme warmth near Bermuda off our east and northeast coastline. And I think thermodynamically speaking, that is going to give us a little nudge as we walk through August, then especially September and then into October. And if you look down there right now, our ITCZ, our waves down there are looking fairly healthy. We can hold convection, we can hold showers and storms and the moisture content with each of these individual waves. Here's the first one that we're really going to be tracking over the next five to seven days still looks fairly okay. Caveat to that, I'll show you here in a moment, we're going to be dealing with that good old-fashioned wave breaking, and our next layer of Saharan air is going to start to walk its way through the Atlantic Basin just to the north of this, which is why I do think most of our global models, besides the Euro and its AI counterpart, don't want to latch on to this. 
Moving on over to our vorticity, you could see across the African continent and into the MDR, we have some fairly positive vorticity signatures. And when I say positive vorticity, I don't only mean upward vertical motion and spin, but I mean they just look fairly good. If you notice, there's that subtropical slash tropical flare-up I pointed out to you on the infrared satellite. We have a wave embedded within the monsoon trough extension off of southwest Africa in the middle of the MDR. And then here comes that next one that's going to continue to meander off towards the west that could try to develop as it gets beyond 60 west. I'll show you why it is it's going to have to do battle with some fairly hostile conditions here in a moment. And then upstream of that, bam, 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 we have that wave train starting to come together. And it's only a matter of time before one or two of these things finally gets its act together. If I move you on over to our precipitable water, uh, forgive me, I haven't pulled this up as much as I probably should have, and I'll go ahead and open it up a little bit so you all can see a little bit better. This is our precipitable water satellite image, basically showing you where your greatest pockets of moisture are. Different from the water vapor, this is only showing you moisture. It's not showing you too much of that dry air, any of the vorticity, or any other kind of feature. It's just showing you water. Notice the name, total precipitable water. It's all the moisture in your atmosphere at all layers. And if you notice, we do have a little bit of that anticyclonic wave break. You see it right there. It's getting ready to come down. That's what's going to try to meet up with our tropical wave that just splashed down off of Africa. We have another wave axis right through there. And then there's that flare-up that's getting ready to move out of the tropics and into the subtropics towards the island of Bermuda. Again, not expecting any development from that, but it's this wave particularly, wave number one, and then another one back behind that that looks a little on the interesting side as we go through our latest computer model data. So first and foremost, this will look at our GFS. The GFS doesn't quite do much. There's our first wave. It runs it face first into some really decent upper level wind shear out of the west, as well as dry air intrusion coming in out of the northeast. You can kind of get a little bit of a glimpse in that, believe it or not, with that pocket of vorticity working its way on the backside of our Atlantic subtropical high pressure. As these two interact, coupled with really good upper level wind shear running face first into that wave, notice that it becomes very strong stretched out, and you don't get quite too much from it. Although for our islands out there, the Leeward Islands, the U.S. British Virgin Islands, and any further west from there, Puerto Rico, Hispaniola, you name it, we're going to see an increase in our overall tropical weather phenomena. You might get some winds out of it. You're going to see some pockets of heavier rainfall. But right now, the GFS anyways is not counting on development, but it is expecting it to traverse your island chain. Now we move over to the actual relative humidity in the atmosphere. And I'm going to walk you through this very quickly as well for the sake of time. There goes our first wave. You can see hot on its heels. Here comes that infamous wave breaking right there. Coming across the apex of our Atlantic Ridge, it's going to be dipping down into the main development region at least about 15 latitude degrees north and beyond that. It's not going to sink too far to the south. But what I really want you to pay close attention to, not necessarily with that first wave, but look what happens back behind it. Look at this really good slug of moisture that begins to work its way off as our African easterly jet, the upper level 500 and 300 millibar jet stream that runs, either, runs east to west across Africa, an indication of the monsoon fairly healthy out there, as well as what pushes those MCS features that eventually become our easterly waves out into the Atlantic. And that right there is going to be our second wave. That's wave number two right there. You can see it right in through here. It looks very elongated, very ragged on the GFS, but when we take a look at the ensembles, you'll notice that once again, in traditional GFS fashion, there is a pretty good amount of discontinuity between the deterministic run and the ensembles. Now, just to give you a crash course, if you're brand new to the channel, deterministic, this is your bread and butter computer model. It gets a little bit of information for the current time that it's going to run, and then it just has fun, the full loop, the full 380 some odd hours that the GFS runs out. It just takes those initial conditions that it digests before it starts to run the panels and goes for it. Ensembles, you get a control, which is your 
most reliable, most likely outcome in terms of separating itself from the deterministic model. And then as we ourselves, the computer analysts and the forecasters go in and kind of tweak the information a little bit to kind of come out to see where it is we get the best amount of agreement, kind of like a focus group at work. That's when you get your each individual ensemble members. So this far out, you want to look at the ensembles. And that's why we're not going to spend too much time here on the GFS Last but not least, this is going to be your upper-level vorticity. This is an excellent tool that I truthfully don't show you all enough to show you things like upper-level shear, positive vorticity streamers, as they're called, which is another indication of that wave breaking I told you about where stable, dry air will come down the backside, or I should say the front side, in this case, of our subtropical high out there across the Atlantic. And as you go through time, watch what happens right through the heart of our Atlantic basin. You see it? There you go. That right there is a textbook signature of your wave breaking, a textbook tropical upper tropospheric trough. It's like a positively tilted trough that extends out from your main branch of the jet stream to the north and leaves behind very aggressive wind shear and typically destroys any kind of chances of tropical development. And it's funny, too, here because... You can see plain as day where the most favorable area of our Atlantic Basin is. We have the dry air dipping in out of the northeast here that's going to kind of shut down the MDR, at least temporarily. And then you have the tut that's increasing your dry air, your sinking air once again, as well as your wind shear. So that kind of nixes the MDR, nixes the central tropical Atlantic, and it only leaves close to home as a favorable spot for development. But that's going to change. As soon as you start to fast forward from there, look at what happens to that tut. It completely washes out just in time for that next wave, which to tell you the truth, halfway through the video already, that's the one I'm really going to be watching. The first one, I'm intrigued. I'm monitoring. There could still be some suspicious action as it gets further west, but I'm not giving it as much of a vote of confidence right now anyways as the second wave that's the one i want you all out there to truly track with me i want you to watch that with me in action as we go over the first seven or so days of august very quickly you can see here i'll go ahead and adjust the screen so you all can get a better view saharan air not too bad you know to tell you the truth we just had that tropical wave come down a little bit of a somewhat dense layer moving across the tropics but then as we get closer to august 2nd and august 3rd Right before that next wave comes off, notice we also get a lull in the Saharan air. That's also going to decrease the amount of unfavorable conditions out there just in time for that convective pulse, the MJO, the Kelvin wave, so to speak, through the tropics to work its way through as well. It's kind of like that tropical lottery I'm sure a lot of you have heard me mention before. Now, this is where it gets juicy. So if you've stuck around to this point in the video, thank you so much for holding out with me. This is where we really got to watch together. So this is your 5,000 foot, your 850 millibar vorticity, your spin, your energy in the mid-level of the atmosphere that we typically watch for the spin and the amplitude of our tropical waves that may try to become something a little bit more than that. This right here, center screen, is your first tropical wave. Not too much to look at right now. Here comes that wave break helping to kind of dive down another big bunch of dry, sinking air, stable air. And then out in front of it, you can kind of get a little bit of a glimpse of that tut getting ready to really show itself across the central Atlantic. But as we go forward through time, notice we still get a little bit of a pocket of, you could say, intensification. Maybe intensification isn't a great word for it, but some consolidation in that energy. And this is very reminiscent of what the AI model does. Where we see the discontinuity is right there. You can kind of see a little bit of a tightening up of that wave before it gets sucked up towards the north thanks to that frontal chain that's still hanging out through the mid-Atlantic states all the way up into the upper north Atlantic. And I think that's why on this model run, you get a little bit of spin with it, but it doesn't quite do too much because you're going to have a lot of wind shear and probably drier air coming off the continental U.S. at this point. But then, before you turn off, look at this guy. There's that second wave, and then a third one in hot pursuit of that. And this is where things get a little fun to watch, to tell you the truth. And I say fun loosely. I don't mean that in a positive sense, because this definitely gives me a clue that, hey, my lesser Antilles and greater Antilles, you need to pay close attention to all of these tropical waves. That one very quickly consolidates and moves off towards the west as a developing tropical storm. And then we end the loop. 
And you can see here, just to the immediate northeast of our Leeward Islands, we have a fairly organized, probably mid-end tropical storm there. And I think personally, even though this is very far out in the run, so a lot of you out there are probably going to say it's going to change, it's going to change, and it will change naturally. It always does. But in terms of your background atmosphere, what the conditions look like to get development out of a wave, this one has a greater chance, a greater fighting chance versus the first one. If the first one can hold on to a little bit of its structure, get into maybe beyond 60 west, even a little further than that, 70 west longitude, getting closer to the Turks and Caicos, the Bahamas north of that, then maybe we see a weak spin up like the AI model is trying to determine, but this is the one I really want us paying close attention to. The AI model here, it does exactly the same thing as the operational Euro. Notice we have that first wave working its way through, and it doesn't quite get going until just east of the Bahamas. Only on this iteration, and it's been very consistent with this, it wants this bad boy to plunge into South Florida before rocking out into the Gulf. Now, I'm very skeptical of this. The AI model wants to die on this hill. It is not back down. The ensembles have not downtrended, so it naturally has me intrigued, and I'm going to continue to watch it. This time last year, the AI model had success with sniffing out what became Hurricane Debbie. Granted, it had that huge jump off our east coast back off to the west coast before the Big Bend landfall, but the AI model has had its good bunch of wins to where I'm not going to discard it. I'm not going to get rid of it. I'm not going to classify it as a happy hour model, and I'm not going to say it's going to happen either. Obviously, consistency breeds confidence, as a lot of our favorite meteorologists out there, myself included, love to swear by. But the fact that this model has been so aggressive with this, just like it was before we saw Andrea, before we saw Barry especially, and the few glimpses we had of 93L and its wraparound effect once again, I give credit where credit is due. So I'm watching this very closely. You can see here on our Euro ensembles, there has been a slight uptick in that wave that's expected to move to the north of the islands right there. It finds that favorable pocket of Atlantic conditions and starts to develop. And then here comes that second one that's really starting to get some good ensemble support and then waves back behind it. I think that's why we're so intersparse out here, so scattered around. This is likely wave two. The first cluster there, and this is likely wave three. I know that's a little confusing. I have a one there and a two there, but this would be our second wave grouped up, and then this would be our third wave grouped up, pending how much the first one at ahead of it gets organized, if we wash out the one behind it because of outflow, or vice versa. If the back one wins out as we go forward in time, we have a lot to track. But what gives me the chills to tell you all the personal truth is the fact that we have these things moving towards the southeast right around the 12th and the 13th of August. And if you've all been watching this channel for a while, I've said 2004 is in my back pocket as an analog, and that definitely has my eyes open. That's another little personal reason I'm watching very closely. Finally, you go over to your AI ensembles and you rapid fire through. Notice, again, there has not been a drop in support for that first wave. Tons of this ensemble agreement that we do see development off our southeast coast, and then we bifurcate or diverge from there. Models touch. Some of the ensembles Ensemble models try to dip to the west as our ridge to the north builds back in. Others try to find an escape route up through the mid-Atlantic or just off the immediate east coast. And then the second wave and then the third back behind it is also gaining a little bit of agreement by the AI ensembles. You could see a pretty active cluster there from the Gulf all the way through to the central MDR. And the GFS, so I don't know if you all picked that up. We got some thunder and lightning happening outside. And then finally, to wrap things up, even the GFS, you know, it doesn't quite love the first wave too much. You can see maybe a, a very small handful of members moving through the Bahamas there. But then look at the second one there as we get closer to August 8th, 9th, 10th. And then look at that right around the 12th through the 13th once again. So our ensembles are sniffing something. Some of our operational models are trying to do something with it as well. And I really do think that regardless of what happens over the next two, three, four days, we can't get ahead of ourselves. I'm not saying development, yes. No development, yes. I'm right in the middle ground here. I'm, I'm kind of walking the tightrope. I'm intrigued by what I see. Some of the science, especially deeper into August, makes sense. So just know for you all out there, this has my eyes wide open. And I think, like we've said in multiple videos before, this is the part getting close to where we have to hold on to our butts.
And with that being said, we'll go ahead and wrap up the video. Thank you to all of you who've watched to the end. Thank you so much for all your genuine support, your kind words, not only wishing me a fast recovery from this nastiness, hopefully getting back home, settled in, back to the grind, back to the gym, will help to flush out the rest of whatever this is from my system. And I really do think I need to be at 110% here within the next few days to track all this mayhem that could be coming across the tropics. So we'll talk to you all again soon. Please stay safe out there. We've got a pretty rough rough heat wave going on across the south and especially the southeast from heat advisories to excessive heat warnings unfolding because of that death ridge that's just hold on for dear life that could come back to bite us in terms of the tropics if these things do slowly get going but we'll see you again very soon from home base i promise you that until next time this is weather center nazario signing out